You know, ladies and gentlemen, it's it's not nice to call people stupid. It's that's a bad thing. I remember when I was a kid, you don't say stupid. You know, don't say stupid. That was just that was pretty much it. And then I would later in life, I would just use the word stupid around kids before I had kids. And the parents, you know, we, we don't say stupid in this house. I'm like, well, that's stupid. No, I didn't. Know. But anyway, you're not supposed to say it. Okay. Uh, however, Sho Shohei Otani's interpreter may be stupid. <laughs> that's it. I look, I know this is not the number one thing on Philadelphia's radar. I, I am just, it's just something I'm amazed by. And we're going to have to get into that conversation a little bit later. Sixers just get spanked by the Suns. There's no other way to put it. They, they got spanked. Grayson Allen dropping threes left and right on you. Uh, the, 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 the Slim Reaper, the other Slim Reaper, that Kevin Durant guy, uh, him dropping threes on you. Um, 50% from the floor uh, with those uh, Phoenix Suns on your Philadelphia 76ers. Tyrese Maxey, four points in the first half. Things things didn't go well for the Sixers last night, As, except, for, except for a little glimmer of hope, a little bit more glimmer of hope with Joel Embiid, because before the game last night, Nick Nurse did offer the latest update on Joel Embiid and when we could expect him back. The timeline, not necessarily put there yet. Still the expectation, the hope of hopes is that he could play at the end of the regular season, uh, which would be about maybe two weeks from now he could come back. But we'll let you hear what Nick Nurse had to say. But man, oh man, last night it was so bad <clears throat> that Isaiah Thomas got to make his 2023-2024 debut. I guess it's still technically that season, but the 2024 debut. Not of Pistons fame. That would really be something, but no, a former Celtics fame, Isaiah Thomas. Last pick in the draft, traded for the number one pick in the draft and one of the, the craziest factoids in sports, uh, but the Sixers just got destroyed. Last night. It was also so bad that it, it, I could take this. For anyone that wanted to stay up and watch that game, uh, you got to see Ricky Council the fourth for the first time in a while, and he had a nice reverse jam. That was fun to see. Everything else, not so much. Everything else sucked. Everything else sucked is basically the way to put it. Uh, the Phillies, they sucked yesterday too. <laughs> Taiwan Walker got shelled in spring training, uh, and the Eagles added a corner. Uh, that's what I want to start with today, the Philadelphia Eagles, not necessarily adding a corner, but – I, I enjoy the windows into players' lives. I do enjoy that. And then when you have behind-the-scenes footage, and the Eagles yesterday released, they released a couple of teasers throughout the week. But yesterday they released a full, you know, twenty-four hour recap of Saquon Barkley's first twenty-four hours as a Philadelphia Eagle. Now, if you watch the press conference, I didn't highlight this for you just because, you know, whatever. Uh, when Saquon Barkley addressed the media for the first time as an Eagle earlier in the week, his daughter was in attendance, and he just said, hey, how's everybody doing? And his his daughter, six years old, seven years old, uh, said, I don't know, don't, don't quote me on it, but um, said, you know, he goes, hey, how's everybody doing at the press conference? She goes, good, Daddy. And I'm like, oh, that's adorable. That's really cute, you know? Especially on this show, and from time to time, my own daughter crashes the program, right? Uh, well, anyway, I thought that was adorable. But what did you know it? This young lady's got a little bit of an attitude on her in the best way. She wants to be a showman. So during this uh, 24 hour you know, coverage of Saquon Barkley, his first 24 hours as an Eagle, his daughter is singing the fight song, Fly Eagles Fly. He's been uh, an Eagle officially at this point for about 30 seconds. He had just signed his contract and she's singing Fly Eagles Fly. And then I thought, you know what? All right, so you know, she's she's got, she's from the area, right? Dad, you know, Allentown. Dad played for the Giants, right? We all know this, right? But has enough family members that are Eagles fans, I'm sure, including, you know, my mom and pop up, Grammy and Grampy, huh? Where she's learning the Eagles fight song has, has it down already. And then I thought, well, the Eagles have scored enough touchdowns against the Giants in Saquon's time here in Philadelphia. I Meaning that you know, every time the Giants played in Philadelphia, she's probably here. She probably heard the fight song enough. She's already got it down. But the cherry on top of all of this is the story Saquon Barkley uh, tells. Now, I can't play it for you, so I have to tell it, okay? Saquon Barkley told this story while he's riding in the car of his daughter coming to games with him in Philadelphia. And at one point, <clears throat> you know, they, you know, at a, well, at a few points, they, they lose the game. But at one point, Saquon decides he's going to take the family out to breakfast. So they go to this little diner, and they're sitting there. And there's a bird. There's a picture of a bird 
wasn't necessarily an eagle. It wasn't uh, specified, but it was above Saquon Barkley's head where he was sitting at the diner. And uh, she goes, oh, no, daddy, watch out. It's the Eagles. And he looks up and he goes, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and just starts laughing and you know, not embarrassed, but it was just like, OK, wow. So every time she sees a bird, she thinks daddy's going to lose. So then she's asking the question to her father about all the times they have lost as members of the Giants. Right. And she goes, so, daddy, you're going to join the Eagles now? And he goes, uh, yeah, yes, sweetheart. And, and she goes. She goes, does that mean we're actually going to win now? <laughs> and he just kind of put his head down. He's like, yeah, that's the goal. That's the idea of all this. So to Saquon Barkley's lovely daughter, she's already one of us in every step of the way. It was like the best thing I saw all throughout yesterday. And I did stay up to, to try to watch the majority of the Sixers. That was not good. Uh, you know, checking in on the Phillies, not great. Not great even a little bit, unfortunately. But – Definitely the way I wanted to start the day today by talking about such an adorable story and absolutely one of us. I, 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 it made me go down this rabbit hole with the Eagles, and I'll share these thoughts with you guys and see what you what you think about your Philadelphia Eagles. Here. But I was just going through the, the depth chart offensively. Like I was literally lining guys up is what I was doing. And I had my wide receivers up there with A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. And like we say the names a lot on this show, but when I wrote it down, and was really looking at it and just how you're going to line these guys up and how you could use them. All. I, I'm just the term embarrassment of riches really doesn't do it. It's it's more than that now. It's, it's yes, a lot of talent. OK, and we've talked about the opportunity of Saquon Barkley and uh, Jalen Hurts lining up in RPOs and how deadly that could be to any defense. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, Howie Roseman has dropped dropped a gauntlet here. This is what is this is what has happened, and I'm not saying it was in some sort of vindictive move to Nick Sirianni. I, I'm not saying this. I, I don't want to paint the wrong picture here, but Howie Roseman, to this point, with the draft still in front of us, whether the Eagles go with an offensive lineman in the first round, whether they go depending on how the board falls to a to a cornerback, whether or not they they add another running back, whether they actually draft a a, a linebacker in the second round. To this point, through free agency, two weeks deep, Howie Roseman has dropped the gauntlet going, I double dog dare you to fail with this. That's what he has done. I am giving you Saquon Barkley on an offense that already has two multiple thousand yard receivers in A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. I You already have a very talented tight end in Dallas Goddard that I feel is a pro bowl caliber talent just hasn't had the opportunity due to injuries to really prove that he could be a pro bowler at the tight end position. You've lost some guys on the offensive line. You lost a guy in, on the offensive line in Jason Kelsey, which we all know about, but still going to be a pretty damn good offensive line. And he's going to bolster that. I'm sure through the draft, maybe even through free agency. He's already done it by bringing in Matt Hennessy, former temple owl, former Falcon. So he's already gotten you some depth there at the position. That's a signing that just kind of goes by the wayside already. But you have all these weapons already offensively. And Howie Roseman decides to give you depth, still on the offensive line, and add, at worst, the third best running back, all-around running back in the NFL. When I was looking at it on paper yesterday, I was like, this is a gauntlet drop by Howie Roseman. I double dog, I triple dog dare you, Nick Sirianni, Ellen Moore even to fail with these offensive weapons because you know don't look at me at the end of the, the midpoint of the season things aren't looking good well if the midpoint of the season things aren't going well right now with uh, this offense in particular I think Sirianni's gone and I think Kellen Moore gets elevated to the interim head coach and then the Eagles go from there but what he has done is challenge Nick Sirianni saying look there are no excuses whatsoever this year in a way, you could say the same thing for Jalen Hurts. I am giving you all these weapons. Don't give me, as we got into yesterday, oh, it's the first year working with this offensive coordinator. Don't give me, oh, it's also a year where you're not going to have a, a, a Hall of Fame center helping you shift protection for blitz pickup or whatever the case. Like There are no excuses on this team. And it's one of the things I look forward to most. Yes, the obvious fact that you do have all this talent is extremely exciting to me. 
But the other part of it is no BS, man. There is no BS here. I mean, even going into last year, <clears throat> DeAndre Swift being here. I love the idea of DeAndre Swift coming out of this backfield. Love the idea. And he put up great numbers for the Eagles. Was he used enough? I still don't think so. But that's a conversation for another day. Still, talent at the position. You already had A.J. Brown. You already had Dallas Goddard. You already had Devontae Smith. We all know the deal there. You were going to have guys like Quez Watkins and Alameda Zacchaeus battling it out for the third wide receiver spot. Devontae Parker looks like the guy that's going to be the leading candidate to take over that position for the upcoming season. And you had a very similar situation. But huge question marks at play caller. My argument going into last year was, that okay, yeah, sure. Not only has Brian Johnson never done this before, but he's got a head coach that just doesn't want to do it. Nick Sirianni tried those shoes on. They didn't fit well. And he immediately, almost immediately into his head coaching tenure said, calling plays ain't for me. Step on up Shane Steichen. So Brian Johnson just had to be a better option than a guy who really didn't want to do it and, quite frankly, wasn't good at it either. So that's not exactly a big vote of confidence for Brian Johnson coming here and having success. Now, up until that San Francisco 49ers game, you were talking about a team that was actually scoring one-tenth of a point more, 28.1 to 28 points per game in the final year of Shane Steichen here in Philadelphia. So the offense was looking good. Not exactly a well-greased, well-oiled machine, but still – for the most part, looking good, could put up points when they really needed to put up points, could make those second half adjustments when they really needed to make those second half adjustments. But but now with, with, with Saquon and now with Kellen Moore, I, I think the, 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 the responsibility pre-draft, so take that as you will, the responsibility here for your Philadelphia Eagles is falling at the feet of Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts offensively speaking, and right now only offensively speaking because they still have more holes to fill defensively, Howie Roseman has put the, the Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts in a position of no excuses. Nick, you want to be the head coach of this team? Just do the thing that the players said at the end of last year that you do so well. Be the leader, take the bullets for the team. Game plan, if you're still doing that, uh, still yet to be determined. The only blurb we have on it was at the end of the year news conference when he said, you know, he's going to be doing a lot of the similar things. But previously, a lot of the similar things was, you know, game planning for his offense. It's never been admitted to that it's going to be the offense coordinator in charge of the offense, which I know sounds really obvious to people. Sounds a lot different than what you heard throughout the entire season if you watched and listened to Nick Sirianni throughout the year. My offense, Brian Johnson calls the plays. Does not sound the same. And then you look at on the other side of things here. Uh, you look at Jalen Hurts. Pick your weapon here, man. The, the Eagles offense last year with 1,000-yard receivers, 1,000-yard running back, multi-purpose threat, you know, multi-threat, coming out of the backfield in DeAndre Swift, which you had in Kenny Moore, or Kenny Moore, geez, uh, which you had in uh, Kenny Gainwell. Not the greatest in the world, obviously, but still had a, a decent second back there. For me, I I'm looking at this team, and I'm just saying this is this is the position right now you want to be in if you're Nick Sirianni or you're Jalen Hurts, where you have all the talent in the world and there are no excuses going into the season. And I know that's far down the line, and a lot can happen, a lot, a lot can change throughout the year. But where we know we're at right now, you could have – the only real question mark on the offense, for me, is the right guard position. You could have Matt Hennessy play that spot. You could have Cam Jurgen stay in that spot, and Matt Hennessy is your starting center next year. You, you could have another spot where you have Cam Jurgens at right guard. You have uh, Landon Dickerson as your center, and you have Matt Hennessy playing at left guard. Like, this is what could happen in the upcoming season. The only big question mark, like, look, Landon Dickerson is solidified as your left guard as far as Pro Bowls and talent and all that, but there's still a possibility that he moves if the Eagles do need him to move. If Cam Jurgens isn't breaking it down, if Cam Jurgens isn't doing a good enough job, Tyler Steen and with Matt Hennessy being here, th there could be a lot of change on the interior uh, offensive line of the Philadelphia Eagles. Most likely, Jurgens, I think at this point, Hennessy, right next to him uh, on his right side at right guard and still Landon Dickerson. I think that's the most likely situation for the Eagles to start the season. But there could be some musical chairs there. 
depending on what the Eagles really like to see. Most likely, yes, Cam Jurgens will be your center. But other than that, man, this is bonkers. I people always really reached. I felt for the AJ Brown is is Terrell Owens. Just talking about on the field. I'm not talking about any off the field drama, any of that. I'm not even getting into that yet. But just in terms of Jalen Hurts and this offense, I am as excited about what this Philadelphia Eagles offense could do in the upcoming season as I was when T.O. got here. Now think about this. When T.O. got here, we all know three losses in the conference championship game. We had screamed and yelled for Donovan McNabb to get a number one wide receiver. For those that even break it down more specifically, they had started running fly routes in this West Coast offense, which was, oh, you don't do that in a West Coast offense. They started doing it with Todd Pinkston and connecting on those deep routes. And I was like, wow, well, wow, they're starting to stretch the field a little bit more here in North to South version uh, of stretching the field. You haven't seen that before. Imagine if you did that with a wide receiver that was, you know, I don't know, Hall of Fame talent like Terrell Owens. We all saw T.O. and Donovan at the Pro Bowl all loving up on each other. Oh, how great was that? And then T.O. gets traded. To the Ravens. Backs out of that. Then he comes to the Eagles. <gasps> but wait, don't get excited just yet. An arbiter has to decide who gets Terrell Owens. And he decides that the Eagles get Terrell Owens. And then it was, oh, my goodness gracious. This is incredible. The Eagles can finally get back to the Super Bowl for the first time since 1980. Like, I remember I remember having that feeling. I wasn't even, I wasn't even around in 1980, okay? I'd just seen this... I'd seen the the, the 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 low lights, if you want to call them that. But this season, and we have a whole offseason to look forward to still. We're only two weeks into free agency here. I am beyond thrilled, pumped that this season uh, is going to have this offense. I, the last time I was this excited was T.O. Now, defensively speaking, <laughs> uh I, I I don't get a sense that people are overly optimistic on Vic Fangio. I do get a sense that people still feel like it was a good hire. Now, uh, do we feel like it's a good hire because it's Sean Desai not being here, because it's uh, Jonathan Gannon not being here? Is the comparison here what is the saving grace? Because if it was, if we were coming from Jim Johnson, certainly not. Well, I'm sorry, we're going from an overly aggressive, not overly aggressive, we're coming from an extremely aggressive defense to a very passive defense? Okay. So who he's replacing definitely matters as to whether or not it's a good hire or not. But then you start thinking about guys that they're going to be putting into this secondary. I love the idea of Chauncey Gardner Johnson being back here in Philadelphia. I'm excited that he is here again. I'm excited for reasons that I stated when he, the, the news first broke. I think he understands the freedom. He does understand the freedom that a Vic Fangio scheme can afford him as a free safety. And uh, how it could also use his versatility as a general speaking, generally speaking, defensive back. Then you add in Bryce Huff. The more I watch on Bryce Huff individually, uh, the more over the last week or so that I have started to uh, gain confidence that he is, yes, ready for this promotion. Still a question mark. It's one of those things that no matter how many press conferences I watch, no matter how many interviews I watch, it's all about the film and just watching them and highlights and all that stuff. And even just normal plays that show you him getting beat and what he didn't do well on a running down, for instance. As time goes on and I watch more and more, it gives me confidence that, okay, he, he maybe he is ready for this promotion. And let, let's face it here. The Eagles just didn't look at 10 sacks like a lot of people and go, oh, yeah, he's great. No, they're looking at everything else to see whether or not he's worth $51 million, which apparently they do. 51.1, was that the number? That's pretty good. Uh, but either way, the speed coming off the edge from him, I am very excited to see what they bring to the table. The question marks also on defense, you have to go with the other cornerback position, how this eventually ends with James Bradbury. The linebacker core. Wow, they actually got a linebacker with some promise in Devin White. Can he really set the reason? You know, hit the reset button on his career here in Philadelphia. I, I'm hopeful, hopeful that he will. I said yesterday, he said all the right things in his press conference. That's the guy that if if that's what he's selling, I'm buying it until he proves me otherwise on the field. But the last impressions we have of Devin White on the football field don't exactly give you that huge vote of confidence. Uh, the Eagles all around. 
coordinator positions, personnel wise, I feel are going to be making um, are going to be making those upgrades and have already made substantial upgrades. Offense to me is look, it's never going to be a finished product. Howie Roseman can, cannot can never say as general manager, "Well, I'm done. This is great." No, he's got to keep adding, and we still have that draft to say one more time. But defensively speaking, I talked about the interior offensive line as being the biggest question. I think defensively speaking, you still have questions about other linebackers on this team who are going to attempt to help you win. You still have questions about who's going to play on the opposite side of Darius Slay. Still have questions there. And then one of the biggest questions that I know a lot of people don't want to get into is Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis. You have Milt Williams in the fray as well. But what are the Eagles going to do with those defensive tackles? How are they going to perform without Fletcher Cox? as the anchor of this defensive line. That's one of those things that similar, but not exactly like, but similar to Bryce Huff, we're not really going to know until we see them out there on the football field. And what really, really sucks about this particular situation is that Jordan Davis looked really good in the early goings of the season last year. And then, like the team, fell apart. Jalen Carter. Looked really good in the early goings of the season. And then towards the end of the year, definitely hit that rookie wall. And let's think about this rookie wall for a second here, okay? You're now going to a 17-game schedule, an 18-week schedule. That that rookie wall, that, that means you got to play one more game with that rookie wall just standing right there in front of you and you banging their head into the brick, man. That is a scary thing. So I would love to tell you that it's all going to be puppy dogs and ice cream when it comes to the end of the season with these two defensive tackles, but that's a difficult prediction to make given what we have seen. Maybe the third year of, uh, of, of uh, Jordan Davis will, will, will help him realize with the shape he's got to be in to start the season so that he ends the season still on a really positive note. Same thing with Jalen Carter. This is where I think a, a veteran presence like Brandon Graham is so important. This is where I also think vocal leaders like Darius Slay like Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, can help some of the quote-unquote young bulls be ready to go. So as I you know, looked at everything on paper yesterday, I saw all these, these great names, this, these extremely talented individuals. It highlighted for me, okay, well, hold on a second. The Eagles are far from perfect. It's not like Howie Roseman is pitching a perfect game here in the offseason. I mean, so far, so good. Still got a lot, of, a lot of other holes to make. And then with the people that are already here and that you already have confidence in, how much confidence can you build up before the season actually starts? The guys like uh, Land Dick, or excuse me, guys like um, Jordan Davis and guys like Jalen Carter are going to be ready to go. Ke uh, Keely Ringo, if he is your starting corner opposite Darius Slay. How he's doing a hell of a job, still got questions. And the gauntlet I mentioned, two people it's down for most, Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts. After that, it's going to come down to talent on the field. The coordinator positions I, I really like, both good hires. But when it comes to everything else, uh, guys, you're surrounded by talent. Talent's supposed to beat, uh, you know, a good team is supposed to get beaten by a team that's extremely talented. And that's what the Eagles are. If I look into this year and let's say that the Eagles just, let's just say they have a good draft, okay? Uh, not, not amazing. There's no, oh, how we got the steal of the draft or anything like that. Like, there's no Jalen Carter this year or something like that, right? How'd you get him at nine, you know? Let's just say they have a good draft. Then Howie Roseman has put this Eagles team in a position to have success. The same thing that we hear from coaches time and time again about their players. We got to put them in a better position to make plays and have success, right? Well, as a general manager, you want to give your coaches and your coordinators the right players to make plays so that they win games. So far, Howie's done a hell of a job checking that box. Hell of a job this offseason. Now we got the draft in front of us. Uh, we got, a, we got a, a little ways to go here. A little more than a month before we sink our teeth into that. Um, there was uh, – I'll get to that later. Uh, before I get to the baseball thing – Baseball and betting is is one of the craziest things to really get into um, when we're going to get into in a second. But I do want to talk about your 76ers. Uh, so last night, 
The Sixers lost 115 to 102 to the Phoenix Suns. I mentioned Isaiah Thomas got to check into an NBA game for the first time in a, eight years. It feels, it feels like eight years. It hasn't been eight years, but it's been a long time. Uh, the Sixers just got destroyed. It was not a good game. They they got manhandled. 30 plus points for Durant, 30, uh, 30 plus points for Grayson Allen in the game. Just making it rain from beyond the arc. But before the game, Nick Nurse offered an update on Joel Embiid. He's going to have to play before the season's over. That's been my take on it this entire time. But this is what Nick Nurse had to say about the 76ers reigning MVP, uh, most recently giving an update on his uh, preparation to get back this season. He is on the court. I, I'm not, I don't want to say daily, but almost every day now where he's on the court doing basketball things. Um, all the checkups have been positive, and we're just trying to – he's kind of in the ramp-up phase now. What, like, what can he handle, and when can he start having contact, and when can he start playing one-on-one, -on -one, and when can he start playing, you know, five-on-five? Five? When can he go through a practice with contact, and then we'll be, then we'll be really close. This is the part that I get nervous. Everything sounds great. On the court, not every day, but pretty much. The ramp-up period. This is the part where you just kind of grit your teeth and bear it. The ramp-up period is where all this could go to hell. When I heard last night him say the phrase ramp-up period, that's when I went, it's okay. This is the, Now it's getting real. What did I say yesterday? When I was talking about the John Clark report over the weekend about how the Sixers do expect him or holding out hope that he does come back you know, to play you know, the final week or two of the season to get him back in shape before the, the playoffs or play-in tournament. I'll just call it postseason in general. This is the word I was waiting for. This is the phrase I was waiting for, the ramp-up period. When he's going to step on the fort, uh, the fort, the court and actually practice and act, not, not just shoot around, not just line up against the trainer, run up and down the court, getting boards, putting up shots against his teammates, playing defense. This is this is what we're on the doorstep of right now, the ramp up period of Joel Embiid. Uh, I, I look, I, you, you watched the the Bucks and the the Celtics last night. If you caught an earlier game, like the Sixers without Joel Embiid are obviously nowhere near that talent level. The Sixers with Joel Embiid, no matter how great a season they have had, they have not been better than the Celtics. They have not been better, but at one point than the Atlanta Hawks for crying out loud. I understand that was a while ago now, but still. Very much burned in my brain. If you're of the school that even if the Sixers get Joel Embiid back, <clears throat> that they're not as good as the Celtics, okay? They're not as good as the Bucs. I like their odds of competing against the Bucs before I like their odds of competing against the Celtics. I think that's a pretty, fairly obvious reason why. The Celtics have been a thorn in their side. The Bucs haven't had that opportunity. But also, it would be really fun to just knock out Doc Rivers, and you just feel like at some point Doc is going to get in the way of them winning. I still want to see it. We, if you're a Sixers fan, we have been a tortured bunch. We stuck it out through the process. We're not going to do a history lesson on that. We know the deal there. But if you have an opportunity here to have Joel Embiid in the playoffs with Tyrese Maxey playing some of the best, the best basketball of his career, then I want to see that. Uh, I'd like to see Buddy Heald figure out how to shoot from three again. That would be nice. I think you got a better chance of seeing that than Tobias Harris really contributing to victories. So we'll leave it at that. I would like to see Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey play at this next level. That's something I would love to see. Even though I don't have, like, watching that, I, I don't think they come back with Joel Embiid and make it out of the second round. I don't think that all of a sudden, oh, he comes back and then the Sixers are going to be great. No, you're going to need that ramp-up period. You're going to need time for Joel Embiid to get back in game shape. You're going to need to get his, his touch back and all that. So these let, next couple of weeks here are crucial. Not even next couple of weeks, just the next two at most. Because then you're talking about not just ramping up, but getting to the point that you're trying to ramp up to, which is actually getting him in games at the end of the season. And then after that, there's a whole other ramp up period of yes, playing himself back into game shape. Look, I, I look. You talk about the Eagles with no excuses. The the Sixers. I'm not saying they're legitimate. I'm not saying they're illegitimate. I'm just saying that they are excuses. They're built in. 
Well, Embiid didn't need it. He, Embiid needed more time. It's a serious injury. Okay, great. Then I'm so glad he was basically forced into playing into that game that he blew out his name a month ago or two months ago. Jeez. January 30th? Yeah. Not great. Not ideal. Look at the Eagles. Not a lot of excuses. Look at the Sixers. Oh, how many excuses you need? It's like a Costco bundle of excuses. Mainly surrounding Joel Embiid. Also, oh, first year of the head coach, Nick Nurse. It's not going to be the same thing. Okay, great. Uh, so that's the latest on Joel Embiid. We'll see whether or not he'll get into it uh, in the next couple of weeks. Here, I'll cross my fingers for it. All right. Now it's time for something really stupid. This is not I – under, I understand this isn't number one on our radar here, but I have to talk about it. Shohei Otani. You think, it's not, okay, Garrett Stubbs has been on the show. Garrett Stubbs has talked about how he's got the best job in baseball. Okay? I would argue the best job in baseball is probably being Shohei Otani's interpreter. Like, let's think about this for a second. You've already learned English. <laughs> You've already got that down. All you got to do is listen to what that guy says. And then you tell the other guy in his in the native language. What'd you say? Whatever language that is. And you go and you say it. That's it. I am hot. That guy's hot. But you say it in, you know, Japanese. It's a little different. Right? That guy messed up his career horribly. Now, there's a bunch of layers to this story. So... Mitsuhara is the guy's name that is the interpreter for Shohei Otani. Allegedly, he's got a horrible gambling problem and bet four point lost four point five million dollars. Allegedly, he has taken that out of Shohei Otani's account to pay off his gambling debt. Allegedly, okay. The Dodgers have since fired him for obvious reasons. Stealing from Otani and betting, okay? Not exactly great things you want in the baseball world. So there's a couple of schools of thought here. There's a what's what it looks like, and then there's the conspiracy theory. What it looks like is, again, uh, this uh, Mitsuhara fella uh, just threw his career away by stealing from the guy he interprets for. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's that. The conspiracy theory is that Shohei Otani was making these bets, but Mitsuhara was placing them. That's the conspiracy theory. No evidence to support. Just a conspiracy theory that's there. Now, here's the other part of it. The booking, uh, what do you call it? The uh, the, 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 the bookmaking company is in South, uh, Southern, uh, South Calif uh, Southern California. They have already been under F un, uh, FBI surveillance. Two stupid things. One, just to bet and steal from Shohei Otani, if that's in fact what he was doing, allegedly. And then to do it with all the gambling that's available out there in the world, why would you go with one that's already, under, not that you know that it's under, under investigation, but you gotta, you probably know that it's shady. Why the hell would you do this? Yes, you could argue backup catcher to JT Romuto. Best, you know, best, you know, best job in sports. I would argue eh, interpreter. <laughs> interpreter for Shohei Otani. Now, the other layer to this, and I admire this. This is a good thing. If Shohei Otani really has nothing to do with this, is everybody's claiming. There's no evidence to suggest that it was him doing it or anything like that. There's some conspiracy th uh, theories floating around out there. But just think about this for a second, okay? If Shohei Otani was missing $4.5 million, if you're Shohei Otani, would you miss it? Because the big tip here was that he was – he, he noticed money missing from his account. All right. $4.5 million is a lot of money. All right. But Shohei Otani just signed a $700 million contract. A lot of it is, is deferred and, and all that stuff and whatever. But I did the math. That's $600,000. Like, excuse me. That's uh, no, 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 no. That's less than 1%. Of seven hundred million, that's less than one percent, and he missed it. And part of me went, "Oh, that's great." 
Again, a lot of money is deferred. I understand, but 4.5 million all of a sudden gone. How does the interpreter get access to the, the money? One other thing is that Otani might have just paid his debt. Just say, hey, man, let me help you out. The other thing is how this all came about. Apparently, Otani was in a meeting, and he doesn't speak that much English from what I've heard. And he was like, hold on a second, what's going on? So through another interpreter, this interpreter had to dime out the other interpreter, the OG interpreter that has been with Otani since he came to the United States to play in Major League Baseball. And he had to be like, oh, yeah, that guy's he's stealing money from you. And then Otani and the Dodgers you know, officially fired him. And, uh, yeah, the investigation continues. I, I The guy had it made, man. The guy had it made. Gambling problem called 1 800 Gambler. Uh, hey, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about the Game Time app. Check out the Game Time app and all they have to offer at the Game Time app, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you want to go to the game? Download the Game Time app. Use promo code FARZY and save up to $1,000 redeemable cash bonus. It is absolutely that much. Uh, excuse me. The Game Time app, save up to $20. That's a little bit different. Uh, save $20 on the Game Time app. The Game Time app is where it's at. If you want to go to the concert, want to go to the game, want to go to the, the comedy event, Game Time app has got your tickets. And when you uh, download the app and you create an account and use promo code FARZY, you get $20 off your first purchase on the Game Time app. That's the Game Time app. They also have last-minute ticket deals, flash ticket deals. And how about this? All-in pricing. So there's no surprises. There's no, uh, what is it called? Ticker, uh, a ticket shock? Price tag shock? At the end of the checking out, it's like, oh, we'll have a $50 service fees. No, no, no. Game Time app, all-in pricing. So you don't have that uh, that shock at the end of it. Uh, so do what I do. Use the Game Time app to get all your tickets and get $20 off when you use promo code FARZY on your first purchase. That's promo code FARZY. And don't forget about the Game Time guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less money elsewhere, Game Time will get you back at 110% of the difference. So download the Game Time app. Have yourself a good time. How about the amazing people at Sky Motor Cars? SkyMotorCars.com. Hook up my friend Brett and check out the amazing inventory at SkyMotorCars.com. How about PHL Sports Nation? Philadelphia Sports Nation, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. That's PHLSportsNation.com. Let's get into the chat check and see how you wonderful people are doing on this fine Thursday morning. This week's just flying by. Uh, Sean Gillespie, good morning. IBH, what's popping? Mike Fuji, what's going on? Uh, Tyler Hall. Oh, that was the, the other thing with the um, with the uh, Eagles I wanted to get into earlier. Thank you, Tyler Hall. Yeah, so Tyler Hall is their slot corner that they just signed. Look, could be a camp body, could be a camp body. Okay, uh, undersized. Five foot eight. Uh, I think he's listed at five ten. Two stints with the Raiders. When I first saw it, I didn't jump to the conclusion that he's like the replacement for uh, Avante Maddox. I think they still like Eli Ricks, and I think they still like Keely Ringo. If there's any positions in the cornerback area that either nickel, dime, um, starter, whatever the case may be, outside guy that those guys are still the leaders in the clubhouse. This is, again, assuming that they move on from James Bradbury. I still think they're going to draft a corner early, first, second round. They can still – so one of those picks, I think, is going to be a corner. I would love to say it's Edron Cooper. I'd love to say that it's uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., but it's not. It's – I still think – if my prediction and my desire are two different things. I, my desire is that they take a corner, even though Howie Roseman's blind spot – Especially in that first round, has it's, it's not it's not been corner. Um, the Eagles haven't taken a corner in the first round since Theodore Shepard, as most of us know by now. So it's not just uh, something that's evaded Howie Roseman. It's something that even goes back to uh, Andy Reid. Uh, so it's been a while for that. But uh, I still think the leaders in the clubhouse to play the the the, the slot uh, corner position, the the uh, your nickel corner is either Eli Ricks or Keely Ringo. I think Eli Ricks would be the leader in the clubhouse for that as of right now. But still, look, has an opportunity to win it, a talented player. I just wouldn't be shocked if it was just a um, a camp body, if you will. Need Kai Jones, B. Costello. What's going on, man? I would love to see him come up. 
love to see it uh, play. No question about that. Uh, love his story in terms of, you know, the redemption story and all that. Uh, would love to see him come up. Eagles are our only hope. Phillies, <laughs> Phillies, same garbage team from two last two years. I, how do you call them a garbage? They're a garbage. Dude, I, we've seen garbage Phillies baseball. We've seen garbage Phillies baseball. A, 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 wow, a complete collapse again for the Phillies. I didn't even start of the season yet. Daniel, what's going on? How you doing? Sean Kilrain, what's going on? April. Hello. Sean Gillespie, Saquon raised a smart kid. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> All right, I'll give you the numbers. They were pretty terrible. All right. Uh, yesterday, oof, it was pretty bad. If you didn't pay attention to what, what the Phillies had going on in spring training yesterday. So Taiwan Walker started the game for the Phillies. And it was a game that the Phillies would go on to lose 13 to 4. So not great is the way I'll put it. Taiwan Walker last night, uh, 6 o'clock start time, I believe it was. Taiwan Walker goes out there in the first inning and gets shellacked. Five runs in the first, two runs in the second. In total, seven runs and two and two-thirds innings of work. Five hits. This is what scares me above everything else. Three walks. Oh, you know what else is scary? Three home runs. Also not great. So he gets uh, just shelled uh, yesterday. As far as the lineup goes, uh, a couple of hits for Brandon Marsh, which was good to see, including a, a double. I believe he had a double in yesterday's game. A triple, excuse me, uh, which is great. Johan Rojas has, has has had his struggles, which is not great for him, of course. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if you still had the outfield of Castellanos, Marsh, and Schwarber uh, to start the season off. Uh, Merrifield I'd love to see in left field, and I don't think that's the way they're going to go. Um, could have Schwarber as your DH with Harper at first. Harper's back issue. I saw Scott Larber said yesterday that this is something that he could be dealing with for the rest of his career. Sounds like a back issue. Not what you want to hear, but definitely sounds like a back issue. Something that you that never really goes away. That's my ultimate concern. The only thing you can do is rest, and then you get like a week, and then tweak it again. Um, hopefully, that's not going to uh, not going to be the case for Bryce Harper, but that's a concern. That's a concern. Uh, but yeah, the Phillies just got absolutely shellacked last night. Uh, Twiz, what's going on? Uh, Demond Miller, what's going on? Wake, wake and bake. Hey, go. Dave Dombrowski, horrible manager. What? You're not a Dave Dombrowski guy? How, three World Series? Two World Series? Five World Series appearances? I'm a Dave Dombrowski guy. I like Dave Dombrowski. Sean Kilmer, what's going on? Tyler Hall, breakdown. Hall's defensive snaps in his career per pro, pro football focus. 301 in the box, 53 wide corner. 14 is a free safety. That's That's surprising to me. Eight on the eight on the line. That's great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sean. Kyle Wright. If this team lines up for the brotherly shove, I want Nick fired immediately. They're not going to not run it. They're not going to not run the foot. They're not going to. They're going to use the tush push. If you have a play. Now, what I would like to see is them not run it so often at the goal line. That's a. It, it, if they have a situation and it was few and far between, and it's really, I guess, uh, what's the word? Um, um, splitting hairs. If they have a second and goal from the one, to, to hand it to Barkley. Last year, I wanted them to hand it to Swift or Gainwell or Rashad Penny in the event that by some divine act of God, he was active. What For the simple reason that I don't want to put Jalen Hurts in a position where he's got to take one more hit or get 21 guys laying on him, okay? I would rather – I don't want 20 guys – would you want 21 guys laying on you? I wouldn't. 
you know? But they're still going to run the tush push in different situations. I really do love the idea of Saquon being like, you know, you just paid me $26 million guaranteed, right? And you want this guy? To... Okay. Saquon, here's $26 million. Now, when you grab his ass. All right. Anyway, <laughs> Farzee sure just got a whole lot sexier. Uh, <laughs> uh, where are we at here? Yeah, Sean, I, I, you, I, you and I, totally the same page. Uh, on the Hall signing, uh, gives them more depth at slot corner. Absolutely. Hutch, what's going on? Saquon Star is more excited to be an Eagle than her pops. <laughs> Maybe. So hold on a second. I got a rich father, and I don't have to play any snaps. This is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go. I'll get you back in there. Uh, B. Costello, what's going on? If Hertz poops the bed. Uh, they shouldn't hesitate to try McKee or Pickett. Holy Stromboli. We're there already. In all honesty, I am a Jalen Hurts guy. If you're the biggest Jalen Hurts fan in the world and Jalen Hurts sucks, like I'll put it like this, okay? Now, I don't want to go here for long. I'm going to give this 30 seconds now, at, at most. I'm not going to go here for a long time. I'm going to give it 30 seconds at most, okay? Let's say Jalen Hurts sucks next year, okay? Let's say he's still ha having uh, horrible game management decisions. Uh, situational football is going out the door. Interceptions late in the game, going for touchdowns when you're already leading in the fourth quarter, going down the field like that. Let's say all that. And he stinks, and the interceptions are are, are up, and the turnovers are up, and, the, and the, the mobility is, again, down and all that. Uh, yeah, then the, the, anyone at the end of this season will have huge question marks about whether or not Jalen Hurts is... <gasps> But I just like the idea. Of, let's go to McKee and pick it. Here's the other thing. You ready? Here's the other thing about the doom and gloom of it all. Am I at 30 seconds yet? I'm probably at 30 seconds already. A lot of a lot of offensive coordinators, I think, could come in and have success with this offense. I also think a lot of quarterbacks could come in and have success with this offense. I, I think if Kenny Pickett plays, this isn't saying there's going to be any type of quarterback controversy. This I'm just saying that if Kenny Pickett gets an opportunity to play, for any reason, and you, if he's just a, if he could just drop back, read a defense quickly, and deliver the football, he, he could be a at worst a Brock, a Brock Purdy. At best, I'll go with at best. That's the way I'll say that. At best, a Brock Purdy. It's entered my mind. If calling plays isn't Chiriani's strength, how the hell was he ever an offensive coordinator? But see, here's the thing. He was an offensive coordinator for an offensive-minded head coach who called plays. That's the that's the interesting thing of it all. Cade Stover, you want to go tight end there, Sean? Okay, uh, I like the I like to see the Eagles draft tight end Cade Stover, six four two thirty five, Ohio State. I yep, my family uh, all uh, all about him. Uh, I, for those that don't know, I married into an Ohio family. My wife's parents are from Ohio, and they're huge Ohio State fans. So Kate Stover, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, yeah, Sean. I don't know if you brought it up before, or if it's something, just something that we talked about. It kind of feels like that moment where the Eagles drafted Brent Selleck for L.J. Smith. Remember that name? The Eagles drafted uh, Zach Ertz when Brent Selleck was still here. Now Zach Ertz is, was there, and you had Dallas Goddard. Now Dallas Goddard's been here. Who's the next guy? The Giants stole Jack Stahl from us. So what are we to do? Anyway. Uh, why are we worried about the O-line? Did Saquon quit? If not, I trust out. Yeah, no, I'm not. It's not a, it's not a worry. But there's, uh, put it this way: I still think the Eagles, and I've said this many times, I still think the Eagles are going to have many. Uh, I still think the Eagles are going to have one of the best offensive lines in all of football. There's going to be a transition period, no question. Very confident in it, but in terms of just the names, my if you're betting, then uh, look, your tackles are are locked in. Lane Johnson and Jordan Mailata. <clears throat> um, I think left guard is. 
95 to 99.99999 percent locked. Landon Dickerson, he's not going to move to center. He's not going to move to right guard. I think that what you're going with here from uh, left to right, Mylotta, Dickerson, Jurgens, Hennessy, um, Lane Johnson. I think that's the way that goes. Stalin, you has a plan, whoever plays in the offensive line, you know. Yep, I agree. Jason A., good morning. Fangio, good hire because all our old guy defensive coaches in Philly have been good. They've been good. Yeah, there you go. Hutch, this is uh all right, Jason A. See, I don't I don't want I don't want that. I want that smoke. Give me all the expectation in the world. Uh Hutch, what's going on? Okay. Farzi, if the Eagles get to the NFC title game or Super Bowl, do the Eagles move on from Nick to avoid losing more? So Hertz isn't on his fifth OC in six years. That's that's the that's the $150 million question. This is what I don't like about bringing in more experienced, more proven coordinators than you do having a head coach. Have you set yourself self up for a vicious cycle of, yep, you'll be great one year and then coordinators move on and then you fall back to Sirianni and whatever, you go to whatever inexperienced coordinator and then Jalen Hurts has to reset and then you have another year where you come back and then you're great again and then you're bad and then you're great and then you're bad. Like it's a It's a vicious cycle that they could be set for. So to answer your question, if it's me, I move on from Nick Sirianni. All right, fire a head coach after I football parish, a second football parish. He's a constant. Uh, yeah, because even though he might be the constant, he might not be the reason. It's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. All right. I you can make an argument for Daryl Morey, but Dave Dombrowski. I do not agree. I like Dave Dombrowski. He's a good baseball man. <laughs> Lou Boo, six hundred trash. Thank you. Uh, players come to Philly and forget how to shoot. It's crazy. April, this is wild. That interpreter blew it. What a great gig you had, man. Mo, I wish the Giants had kept Barkley, but I wish him well, except for two games. Uh, I see him playing only 10 games. Well, gee, thanks, Mo. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and assume... You're a Giants fan. April, the conspiracy theory is probably from a butthurt A's fan. <laughs> uh, the whole Tani thing stinks. Mo, the guy talking looks like Nick Sirianni. Well, that would be me. Wait, did you say Soriani? What is he, Canadian? Sorry. We ran the tush push again. Sorry. Yes. I, it's been told many times that I look like Nick Sirianni. Like, if he shaved his head and just went on a bender for three weeks. Uh, where was I? Was, I was at Trader Joe's, and the guy, uh, the the cashier fella, uh, was was looking at me, and he was like, uh, "Dude, <laughs> I like I had a hat on, and he just went. It was, it was awkward, the amount of staring." And it was unapologetic. It wasn't like he was like looking at me, looking away, looking at me, looking away. And I'm like, dude, just bring it up, man. <laughs> just, that's all we have to do here. And he's just like, he's like, dude. He gave me one of those. He's like, dude. Because you know how they're like really friendly? Like they know you? Like they're your friend at Trader Joe's? Um, I, I have a whole theory on Trader Joe's. But he's looking at me and he's just like, dude. How many people tell you like Nick Sirianni? And I was like, a lot. He's like, Man, you could get on Cameo and just do Nick Sirianni stuff. And I'm like, not a bad idea, but uh, no thanks. Uh, by the way, here's my theory on Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's, maybe it's just because I'm such a Costco guy now. Uh, Trader Joe's is like a tapas menu. A tapas. Let me say that one more time with more emphasis. A tapas like menu grocery store. Like my wife will come back with these things or I'll come back with these like little meals that are supposed to like, oh, he's a family of four. And I'm like, that is that is one portion. That is just for me. This is a not this this is like everyone gets one piece of General So's chicken, which is delicious. If I have to vouch for anything at Trader Joe's, 
It's the General So's chicken with the chicken fried rice. That is my go-to. If I'm going to Trader Joe's, if I'm making the run and not my wife, oh, I'm, that's that's a two-pack, baby. I'm not just getting one. I'm getting two packs of those. So it's really four because it's two packs of the chicken fried rice uh, and then uh, two packs of the General So's chicken. And because I'm such a health nut, I only use a, ha- a, a, a pack and a half. I don't use the full two packs of the General So's sauce that comes along with it because I'm a health nut. Anyway, uh, that's enough of that. All that because a guy told me I look like Sirianni. Sorry for my family guy brain. <laughs> Sean Gillespie. Otani probably thought the four and a half million was banking fees at first. Probably. Dank one, Barkley. Baseball is the best scandals. They really do. Baseball scandals are the best scandals. Farzi, time is always flying. Do you think the Flyers can make it? These next few games are rough. Here's what I'm going to do with the Flyers. This is a win-win situation for me. Uh, I don't even know where they're at right now in the standings, but I know they're you know flirting with the playoffs. Um, I, but I want to be specific here, so let me pull it up. Uh, here's, here's where I'm at the Flyers. I'm at a win-win situation. I'm in a win-win situation with the Flyers because if they make the playoffs, awesome, great, we get playoff hockey, baby. If they miss the playoffs, then fine, better draft pick. I'm that's where I'm at because before the season, this is why the season always matters. People are like, "Ah, oh, you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it." Like the optics of it matter. Okay, the eye test here matters. I, 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 when the season started, I didn't want them to do anything to make the playoffs. I didn't want them to make any push. I didn't want to make any big acquisitions or anything like that. Uh, Jamie Drysdale, fine. But as of right now with the Flyers, I would love to see him in the playoffs. I'm not pissed off if they miss the playoffs. That's where I'm at. If they if we get playoff hockey, I'm excited. If they miss the playoffs, I'll be like, all right, that's that's what I wanted at the beginning of the season. Wild card standings in the Met. What the hell is going on here? Okay. Atlantic Division. Uh, Bruins, Panthers, Maple Leafs, Metro Division, uh, Rangers, Hurricanes, Flyers. Okay, that's the standings right now. Uh, Flyers are beep up up. Uh, behind the Panthers, who they or I'm assuming behind the Hurricanes, who they have tonight by 14 points. They've all played 69 games. Nice. Uh, That's where they're at right now. As for... What the hell is going on here? Okay, if the season ended today, they would draw the Hurricanes. That's where that would go. As the third place team in the Metro Division plays the second place team in the Metro Division. The first wild card team, who right now is the Tampa Bay Lightning, they take on the Rangers. Uh, the Maple Leafs would take on the Panthers, and the Red Wings would take on the Bruins. Second wild card team taking on the number one seed. Uh, so that's the way that looks right now. Uh, as for the Flyers' upcoming games, let's see. Panthers, or, why do I keep doing that? Hurricanes tonight. They end on the 16th. They have had Florida's number this year for whatever reason, man. It's been pretty awesome. Hurricanes, Bruins, Panthers on the road in Carolina tonight. Then they host the Bruins, host the Panthers, then at the Rangers. Yeah, that's a tough stretch right there. Beating Toronto was huge. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be blind optimistic. I'm just going to say they're going to make the playoffs. Let's go that way. Dank one, uh, Dank, Dank one, I'm with you. Oh, gosh, I did forget about uh, McPherson. <laughs> Shout out to Mrs. Farzy. Yeah, she doesn't get enough love on the show. She gets enough love on the show. She's a, no, she's awesome. I I did. I married, I married a wonderful woman. It's a true story. And let's not forget, she is just, she is so lucky. Just so... I'm I'm lucky, blah blah blah. Uh, 
Hey, I liked Rob Thompson at first, uh, but then seeing he wasn't the answer. Uh, like, there's no Craig Kimbrell, so I feel like we'll be better off. But then it's like, who's going to have blind loyalty to in the playoffs? <laughs> Sean Gillespie, 21 guys letting go. This is supposed to be about sports. It's about the touch push, man. Dank one, Barkley. Uh, Steam will be the right guard. We'll see. Oh, the orange chicken from TJ's is the bomb. I miss TJ. The closest one is two hours from you. Really? I do like, I do. Yeah, Trader Joe's is definitely growing on me. John Smith, who should lead off for the Phillies? Well, who should lead off is Trey Turner. Who is going to lead off is Kyle Schwarber because. Look, there is something that the analytic people, there's some measure of baseball that is just weird about a Phillies uniform, the atmosphere in South Philadelphia, and Kyle Schwarber leading off. You can still get him plenty of at-bats to hit home runs if he's batting second. But whatever. Love General So. You know General So is like a big lie? Like, you know the legend of General So's chicken? It's like not real. Like you go to China and you just know General So's chicken. There is a story of General So. Uh, the story is something along the lines of he stole money from Shohei Otani. Kidding. Okay. Uh, um, the story is that this General So guy uh, was like fighting in this war and stuff. And he goes, um, I, I know it'll get him. I know it'll get my enemy. I'm going to feed him chicken, but I'm going to poison it. Yeah, that's the ticket. And he poisons this chicken and they all die. Hope you have a great day, everybody. No, um, that's a, that's like the story of General So. I that's what I heard one time many years ago. So that's what I'm basing it on. I haven't looked it up recently. So enjoy that General So's chicken. Neil Watson, uh, Flyers are overachievers, and it's fun to watch. I'm see Neil. You and I are on the same page. Jason, a., my wife loves Trader Joe's. I got one near me. There you go. Yeah, I do enjoy. I do enjoy Trader Joe's. Weird, weird things happen uh, when I go to Trader Joe's. See the Sirianni thing, and uh, the other time, a, a guy who worked there goes, "Hey, hey, hey! Can you take your hat off for a second? And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> he goes, "I knew it was, you're the, you're one of the bald guys on Fox." And I'm like, "Yes, I'm one of the bald guys on Fox. Thank you. People are awesome." You know what? On that note, let me say something nice. I was at, I was actually at Costco yesterday, and I, a guy was on the phone, and I'm walking by him, and uh, he he just goes, "Hey, Mark, how you doing?" Just like that, and he said it in a way because I'm closer to where I grew up now, where we moved out of the city. I'm closer to where I grew up, and um, I every once in a while we'll run into people like I went to high school with, you know. And um, he said it like he knew me. Now he was substantially older than me, so like we didn't go to school together. And but he gave me like this hello, like I was I was waiting for the oh we met at the thing, or I'm so and so's cousin or whatever, just something like that, and nothing, just oh hey Mark, and then just kept kept going, and I was looking at him like I have no I've never met this person I have no idea who they are, it was just a pleasant hello from someone that I let I guess knew me from doing stuff in front of a camera and, and on a microphone I don't know. Um, what I'm telling you is I'm just really popular. No. All right. Anyway, that's enough of that. Thanks, everyone, in the chat. You guys are wonderful as per usual. Uh, morning Rush, uh, brought to you by Sky Motor Cars. Again, the Flyers are at it tonight against the Carolina Hurricanes, 7 o'clock. Puck drop. Oh, by the way, April, another one of my cousins moved to North Carolina. Uh, Hampstead? Hampstead? Yeah. I told you the cousin moved to Topsail not too long ago. It's this cousin's mom. My other cousin, not my aunt. So it's my dad's first cousin, my second cousin. Anyway, a relative of mine moved to Carolina. So there we are. Uh, Sixers off tonight. They'll try to bounce back from their horrendous loss last night uh, to the Suns. They got the Clippers, who got a little bit off the schneid last night. Oh, excuse me, they got the Lakers, then the Clippers. The Lakers tomorrow night, 1030. And then Sunday, they got... Uh, James Harden and the Clippers at 3.30 Sunday afternoon. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You guys are wonderful. Really? April, thank you for that nugget. It is the Italian side of the family. I will be passing along this information if they haven't found it already. Thank you, April. A uh, nice little Italian market there in uh, Hampstead. Wonderful. Hey, everyone. Fun with you guys as always.
per use, right? My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzi Show. I'll be on with Bill Calarulo at 1020 today on the Jacob Media Sports Channel. So make sure you guys don't miss that. Me and Bill hanging out uh, at 1020. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzi Show presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Catch you guys at 1020 and then again tomorrow morning. See you then.